it's such a pleasure to be here today. I wish I was with folks in, in person in Madison. I've only been there once. I just for a, an afternoon when I was traveling uh, across the country with a band, but I remember there were good used bookstores and good food downtown. So um, this isn't quite the same experience, uh, but, uh, but I feel uh, really honored to be invited to give this talk and, and a kinship with the Haven Center. Um, so yeah, again, to recap, I'm both an organizer and a writer and an occasional filmmaker. The talk I'm about to give draws on this recent book, The Age of Insecurity, Coming Together as Things Fall Apart, which was given as, um, the, as last year's Massey Lectures. So uh, I traveled across Canada and got to give a series of talks. Didn't do um, anything comparable in the United States. Uh, you know, it was a... Um, uh, and it was a book I was writing simultaneously. Uh, I was also simultaneously writing the, the book on solidarity that Adrian mentioned. I just got my first copy, so I'm gonna show it off for a second. It comes out uh, a month from yesterday. <laughs> so it comes out in March. So these ideas of insecurity and security to me are, are, are twin concepts in way, ways I'll explore here um, and, and really sister projects. Uh, I did not make a PowerPoint, so feel free to turn off the video and just listen, except I, I did want to start with one visual thing. I wanted to start with a, a short six minute animation called Your Debt is Someone's Asset that I created with the artist Molly Crabapple. And I'm beginning with it just to actually give a little sense of the debt collective. Um, so the debt collective is the world's first union for debtors. Um, our idea is that debt is actually a form of leverage if people can come together and, and, um, and make it so and figure out how to work collectively. And I, and I just, uh, the debt collective is something I'll be talking about, but it is something that really grounds my thinking. Um, you know, I, I really do believe theory and practice are interconnected, and that I, especially when you're talking about issues of democracy, of social justice, you, know, you have to figure out where the rubber meets the road. You actually have to figure out how to try to do stuff, how to try to put your ideals into action because it will actually help you think better. <laughs> and actually those two processes are not uh, disconnected, but to me, very integral, right? That think about where you wanna go, you try to do it, you try to build power, you experiment, you learn through that process. And it actually, um, you know, makes you, uh, it, it helped, it's a learning process. It's a very intellectual process. Um, but yeah, just to give a sense of, of what, uh, what is at the heart of the debt collective, I thought I would uh, share this. So I'm going to share my screen again. It will be about six minutes and then I'll be back. The American dream used to be owning your own home. Now it's being debt free. Altogether, Americans owe a record-breaking $15 trillion in counting. Sold as a lifeline, debt is too often an anchor, dragging people down with compounding interest and fees, pulling wealth and resources from the working class to bloat Wall Street's bottom line. Every debt we hold is someone else's asset, with our monthly payments providing steady revenue streams for greedy creditors. Households with credit card debt pay around $1,155 a year in interest alone. Americans now die owing an average of $62,000, much of it credit card debt. A significant amount of the $770 billion of credit card debt slashing around is medical bills. Ambulance rides, doctor's visits, and surgeries paid for with the swipe of a little plastic card. Then there's the additional $140 billion of medical debt and collections, combined with an estimated $50 billion in back rent and $1.4 trillion in auto loans. Much of this debt didn't exist a few generations ago. Consider the $1.8 trillion in student loans this country now holds, which wasn't a problem in the 1960s when college was often free, or close to it. Ronald Reagan helped change that. He made his name by demonizing protesters on the University of Berkeley campus. In 1967, as governor of California, he pushed the university system to start charging students tuition so they would, quote, think twice about whether they wanted to pay to carry a picket sign. During his career as senator, Joe Biden advanced Reagan's project, working to expand student lending. As a senator from Delaware, the credit card industry capital, Biden was a devoted servant of the financial sector. 
He fought relentlessly for 2005 legislation that weakened borrower protections and made bankruptcy more difficult for regular borrowers, strengthening the hand of the student loan and credit card industries and helping cause a wave of home foreclosures. But debt is not just about money. It's about power. Debt has long been both a source of profit and a tool of social control and racial domination. The Founding Fathers knew this. Thomas Jefferson argued that debt should be canceled after natural limits, which he took to be about a generation, but only for white men like himself. In 1803, he wrote that debt should be used as a weapon against indigenous people to steal their territory. We shall be glad to see the good and influential individuals among them run in debt because we observe that when these debts get beyond what the individuals can pay, they become willing to lop them off by a cession of lands. Sharecropping, redlining, predatory lending all continued this trend, deepening racial inequities. As a result of the 2008 mortgage crisis, black and brown families lost upwards of 50% of their collective wealth. For regular debtors, even a late payment can spell disaster. A tanked credit score can make it impossible to rent an apartment or get a job. Default on your student loans? The government can seize your wages, tax refunds, and social security. Debtors' prisons are technically unconstitutional, but in practice, people struggling to pay medical bills or court fees can wind up in jail. But not all debtors are treated so cruelly. Rich people regularly walk away from their obligations and companies engage in strategic defaults. The banks that crashed the economy in 2008, they got bailed out. Donald Trump, the self-professed king of debt, left a string of corporate bankruptcies in his wake. And don't forget that during the COVID pandemic, the federal government spent hundreds of billions of dollars buying up bad corporate debt belonging to entities, including Exxon and Walmart, and offering companies, including payday lenders, forgivable loans. It's time regular debtors got a break too. It's time for a jubilee, the erasure of debts and a rebalancing of power between regular people and elites. It's not a new idea. Jubilee was described in the Bible, and many ancient civilizations had periodic jubilees to avert social and economic collapse. Our earliest recorded histories are stone tablets inscribed with credit ledgers. Nearly as long as debt has existed, debt cancellation has existed too. Throughout history, debtors have risen up to demand relief. In the early 6th century BCE, a debtor's riot helped nudge ancient Athens towards democracy. The reforms, known as the shaking off of burdens, included debt absolution and an end to debt bondage. Something similar happened in ancient Rome after debtors mounted the world's first general strike. In the United States, indebted workers and farmers revolted in the colonial era, and then again during the Great Depression. Later, the call for debt cancellation rang out at Occupy Wall Street. In recent years, striking debtors helped force the government to cancel billions of dollars in student loans. Abolishing medical debt, back rent, and student loans would free up money now spent on debt servicing for other things. People could buy homes and start families, and the racial wealth gap would narrow. Research estimates that canceling student debt alone would boost the economy by up to $108 billion a year and create a million jobs. Under pressure from activists, President Biden campaigned on a promise to cancel an immediate minimum of $10,000 of student debt per borrower. Thanks to the Higher Education Act of 1965, he has the power to cancel all federal student loans. With a single signature on an executive order, President Biden can free people from student debt, giving tens of millions of people their lives and futures back. Now, we need to make him do it, and much more. We deserve nothing less than a jubilee. Okay, now I need to make it stop. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching that. Um, yeah, and I just, again, wanted to give that context of, you know, that's one way of describing what the Debt Collective is about. We are, again, the world's first debtors union, um, yeah, uh, a membership organization. Um, but I also just want to give context uh, and say that, you know, some of the, the thoughts I'm uh, going to be sharing and, and my recent books really, again, emerge out of the organizing. So it's not like theory comes first, then practice. <laughs> practice informs the theorizing. And I think that's really important because um, activists are 
often sort of portrayed as kind of mindless, <laughs> um, not as intellectual or kind of um, reacting to circumstances. And for me, um, this connection between theory and practice is just so so critical and I think so fruitful. Um, so yes, um, uh, you know, so the, the name of the, the talk today is, is uh, the alchemy of organizing from insecurity to solidarity. And that is just something I see in our organizing all the time, which is people who are living in a state of financial secure insecurity, a vulnerability, coming together and trying to build collective power. Um, uh, and uh, as the, um, the animation mentioned, uh, Occupy Wall Street, so I want to actually begin there. Uh, Occupy Wall Street is widely credited with kind of putting discussions about class and inequality back on the American agenda. Um, you know, these topics had sort of long been out of bounds. And now, uh, you know, in the decade or, you know, 11, 12 years since, these statistics about inequality are really commonplace. So, you know, since 2020, the richest 1% has captured nearly two thirds of all new wealth globally. That's almost twice as much money as the rest of the world's population. Um, at the beginning of 2022, it was estimated that 10 billionaire men possessed six times as much wealth as the poorest 3 billion people on earth. In the United States today, the richest 10% of households own more than 70% of the country's assets. And some of those assets are other people's debts, <laughs> as that animation just uh, <laughs> described. These statistics uh, and others, there's, you know, I could go on and on, are absolutely appalling, but they're also, again, really familiar. Since the issue of inequality was catapulted onto the national stage more than a decade ago by Occupy Wall Street, inequality has become a frequent topic of conversation in American life, right? It helped animate the Bernie Sanders campaign. It's reshaped academic scholarship. It's always, you know, uh, being discussed on the opinion pages of, of uh, our newspapers, it shifted public policy, you know, and it continues to galvanize um, uh, organizing and protest movements. And, you know, it's really informed my um, thinking and writing about things as well. You know, I wrote a book on democracy and sort of at the heart of it was the idea that in economic inequality corrupts the democratic project. Certainly outrage at inequality was a big motivator for starting the debt collective. But what I wanna argue in this, this talk is that inequality, um, however necessary it is to talk about it, and it is incredibly necessary because it is obscene, it's also insufficient. And I wanna offer a complementary frame. And I think that complementary frame is insecurity. If we want to understand contemporary economic life, we need a more expansive framework. And I think insecurity can help us here where inequality encourages us to look up and down, right? To note extremes of indigence and opulence, this enormous gulf between the haves and the have nots. Insecurity encourages us to look sideways. And as a result, it encourages us to recognize potentially powerful commonalities, even if people aren't necessarily in exactly the same boat as us. Inequality, for example, is something that can be captured in statistics. It looks at income and wealth quintiles and the distribution of resources. Insecurity uh, requires talking about feelings. It is, to borrow a phrase from feminism, personal and political. Uh, economic issues I've come to realize through my organizing are also always emotional ones. So I'm thinking of the spike of shame when the bill collector calls, the adrenaline when your rent or mortgages do, the foreboding so many millions of people feel when they think about retirement. So insecurity is an affect, a feeling, but it also describes a material circumstance, material reality. So it blurs those categories in ways that I think is, is actually really useful. So unlike inequality, insecurity is more than a binary of have and have nots. Its universality reveals the degree to which unnecessary suffering is widespread, even among those who appear, at least on paper, to be doing well. We are all to varying degrees overwhelmed and apprehensive, fearful about what the future might have in store. We're on guard, we're anxious, we're incomplete, we're exposed to risk. So we, you know, and this causes us to behave in certain ways. It causes us to scramble, to strive, to try to shore ourselves up against potential threats. Um, you know, uh, it causes us to, to constantly be anxious and, and engage in strategies to try to achieve a modicum of security in this insecure world. Uh, 
So I think it really shapes our behavior. And just as an aside, you know, there's been a lot of discussions lately about, um, well, depending on who you are, who you're reading, uh, uh, people, Americans' perceptions of the economy and whether people are being too um, negative about the American economy, whether it's there's not, you know, there's a vibe session, there's been different discussions. And, you know, more and more what people are saying is actually that, no, actually folks are being rational. I mean, I would say people are irrational to be to not be enthusiastic about an economy that's as incredibly unequal as ours is. But, you know, when people parse the data more carefully, what they're seeing is that it's it's when people look forward that they feel um, uh, the most um, negative about things. And that makes sense because, you know, insecurity is always forward looking. You might have a roof over your head now, but you can still be insecure if you think, gosh, I might get evicted or I might, my rent's going to, I know my rent is going to be raised in an unsustainable way, in a way I can't pay. Yeah, I have a job now, but I don't have job security, right? So insecurity is forward looking as opposed to inequality, which is the snapshot in time. So pervasive insecurity causes us to behave in certain ways, to scramble <laughs> and try to achieve security, uh, which for the most part eludes us. And that's because the main mechanisms by which we're told to gain security for ourselves, making money, buying property, earning degrees, saving for retirement, often involve being invested in systems that do not provide the stability we crave. The stock in our 401k, if we're lucky enough to have one, all too often supports industries that poison the planet. For example, the tech company maybe that we work for undermines democracy. The rising price of the home we just bought makes it harder for others to stay housed. So the security systems we have, and I use that term you know, very loosely, ultimately um, undermine the security that we seek. Of course, and this is important, living with uncertainty and risk is absolutely nothing new. Um, you know, it makes sense that mortal creatures like ourselves would feel insecure. We're all uh, vulnerable, we're all fragile, we can all be wounded physically and psychologically. The precarious and unpredictable nature of life is what helped inspire the ancient Stoics to counsel equanimity or for Buddhist thinkers to develop the concept of Zen. So this is, what I call existential insecurity, a kind of insecurity that is indelible to being human. And I, ultimately, I think existential insecurity is a beautiful thing. It, we, are, we are fragile creatures who need care, who are not totally dependent. We're deeply interdependent with others. So, you know, there's an element of insecurity we can never escape or armor ourselves against. Um, that kind of existential insecurity is, is not what I'm focusing on here. Uh, rather, uh, I want to talk about the way ways we structure societies and how the ways we structure societies can make us more secure or less so. <laughs> and this is what I call manufactured insecurity, where existential insecurity is an inherent feature of our being. Manufactured insecurity facilitates exploitation and profit by waging a near constant assault on our self-esteem and our well-being. Our economic system capitalizes on the insecurities it produces, which it then prods and, and perpetuates, making us all insecure by design. Only by reckoning with how deep manufactured insecurity runs will it be possible to envision some, something different. So manufactured insecurity is far from inevitable, and I think it is intensifying. And the same uh, shifts that have supercharged inequality in recent decades are to blame here, right? So I'm talking about the deregulation of finance and business, the decline of the welfare state. Uh, this is all heightened inequality and heightened insecurity and left no one wealthy or working class totally unscathed. While the relatively privileged seek ways to shield themselves from risk and can even turn periodic shocks to their advantage, They've, they've rigged a game that can't be won, <laughs> and one that keeps them stressed and scrambling and breathing the same smoke-tinged air as the rest of us. Um, so I think they too actually have a lot to gain. They being the privileged, they being um, the economic elites have something to gain from reimagining uh, different forms of security. Okay, so one example I like to give uh, that I've given in talks, I give in my book, of manufactured at uh, in manufactured insecurity at its most ridiculous goes as followed. So, um, and this was just a moment that sort of crisp, crystallized it. Um, it had never occurred to me in all my years on this planet, four decades, to fret over the fat in my cheeks. In fact, I did not know the word buccal fat. I had never heard this phrase before until I was reading The Guardian, which is, you know, progressive news outlet. And I saw 
it described as, quote, the fresh source of insecurity to carry into the new year. So I think you, know, you can understand manufactured insecurity on this basic level, the way that we're all assaulted every day by, by ads, by marketing, uh, by stereotypes that are just there to make us feel bad about ourselves, right? Uh, you know, whether it's you get your cheek fat or the way you part your hair, your jeans, your car, or whatever, the, the, the color you painted your walls, right? You know, we're just constantly told what we're doing isn't right, but if we buy this product, you know, we'll feel better and we'll be better. As the British political theorist Mark Niklaus has noted, the modern word insecurity entered the English lexicon in the 17th century, just as our market-driven society was coming into being. So the modern word insecurity is very much connected, he argues, to the historical development of capitalism. I would just put it very simply, capitalism thrives on bad feelings. Why? Discontented people buy more stuff. This is an insight that the old American trade magazine, Printers Inc., stated bluntly in 1930, quote, satisfied customers are not as profitable as discontented ones. It is hard, of course, to imagine any advertising, uh, uh, any advertisement or any marketing department, you know, telling us, hey, you, you're actually okay. You're fine. <laughs> it's a world that needs changing. Um so manufactured insecurity, I think, is, you know, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's all around us. It's, it's uh, in the ads that we're subjected to every day. And the message of it is that, um, you know, hey, if you amass money in objects, those can be kind of surrogates. But, uh, of course, they always fall short because they actually can't replace the kind of security that we're really looking for, the kind of security that cannot actually be commodified. So that's connection, meaning, purpose, contentment, safety, self-esteem, dignity, respect. Those are things that can only be found in community with other people. So part of the insidious and overpowering, uh, uh, so, sorry, overwhelming power of insecurity is that unlike inequality, it is subjective. And this gets back to that point I was making about it being forward-looking. Uh, it's really, it's not just about the here and now, Sentiments or how real people actually feel rarely map rationally onto statistics. You do not have to be a rock bottom to feel insecure because insecurity results as much from expectation as from deprivation. Unlike inequality, which is again, the snapshot of the distribution of wealth at a certain moment in time, insecurity anticipates what's happening, what anticipate what's, what's gonna happen. So this is why insecurity affects people on every rung of the economic ladder. Even if, and this is of course important, it's hard, you know, insecurity's hardest edge, no doubt, is reserved for people who are um, the um, have historically been the most discriminated against, you know, people who have the least, um, at, you know, so it is absolutely experienced unevenly, even if I'm arguing that it is universal. Uh, recent years have produced an abundance of scholarship demonstrating the negative effects of our deeply unequal, insecure. A social order on health and happiness across the board. You know, there's lots of scholarship that shows that rising inequality and in, in the insecurity it causes correlates with higher rates of physical illness, depression, anxiety, drug abuse, addiction, and the like. Living in a highly competitive consumerist society makes everyone more status conscious, more stressed out, more sick. Um, and this was something the philosopher Jeremy Bentham wrote about uh, long ago. Uh, he wrote about the fear of losing, that, that's his phrase, and how wealth itself can become a source of worry. Assets must be guarded and grown after all, lest fortunes be diminished or lost. And so here's what he, he wrote, and I think it's worth quoting. This is from The Theory of Legislation, which was published in 1802. When insecurity reaches a certain point, the fear of losing prevents us from enjoying what we possess already. The care of preserving condemns us to a thousand sad and painful precautions, which yet are always liable to fail of their end. So Bentham is talking about money and objects, which can be taken away, which can be stolen by thieves, but he could have just as easily been talking about, um, about status, which is impossible to steal yet is never secure. In a world of economic extremes, even the most prosperous are afraid of losing rank, of falling both in net worth and self-worth, and it is this insecurity that keeps them grasping ever upward. These people are suffering for what economists have called fractal inequality, which I think is a really useful concept, right? So when you are trapped in this fractal's snare, 
the overwhelming sensation is one of insecurity. The person who is in debt, the folks that we organize with the debt collective, look to the person with zero dollars and they think, hey, that looks good. But the person who has zero dollars looks to the person with 50 grand, who looks to the person who has six figures, who looks to the person who has half a million dollars, who looks to the person who has a million, who looks to the person with twice as many assets and so on and so on and so on. Everybody is always looking up. And this really hit home for me uh, a few months ago. Um, uh, right as I, as I was writing this book, I went to a party at a penthouse in apartment, a, a penthouse apartment in Manhattan. And a, I met a woman who just like very honestly talked about being sort of stuck in that spiral. Um, so I was at this party making the pitch to, uh, making a pitch to potential donors on behalf of an independent leftist magazine, as one does. Uh, so it was clear just by her being in the audience that she had independent means that she um, that that she had wealth. And she told me actually point blank that normally she would be at pains to hide that. She wouldn't just wear that on her sleeve. So I asked her, you know, making sort of conversation, what it brought her to the party. Um, and she told me that she had joined a network of wealthy people who's pool, who pool their funds to support social justice causes. She told me she sought that group out after receiving a substantial inheritance. Her father had been a newspaper magnate in the Midwest. Initially, she told me she'd been overwhelmed by her windfall, this incredible good luck, this you know, treasure trove of money she had done nothing to earn, and she wanted to be emboldened to give a good portion away. But the main effect of her coming to know other wealthy people, she told me, was that she felt poor and insecure in comparison. Her good fortune suddenly paled next to the tens and hundreds of millions, even billions that others in this network had. So this dysphoria of feeling you don't have enough, even when you objectively have a lot, you know, I want to argue is not just a, a spontaneous reaction to seeing others with more, so a kind of lizard brain lust, um, but rather the consequence of living in an insecure and risk-filled world in which there are no upper and no lower limits on wealth or poverty. Left unchecked or rather untaxed, the fractal spiral never ends. And we see this, of course, in the ridiculous and also terrifying parade of Silicon Valley billionaires jockeying for dominance. Um, Another story about manufactured insecurity that I tell uh, and that I want to tell here uh, speaks to the realm in which most adults spend their waking hours, the workplace. So a few years ago, my sister was working at a hip Brooklyn cafe. Uh, and it was a place that, you know, I like to visit. It had a kind of hip vibe. It had kind of a vaguely Parisian aesthetic. It was retro and low tech. And there were regulars, including a medievalist who liked to chat. On a slow day, uh, my uh, a barista on duty, wasn't my sister, was exchanging pleasantries with the medievalist when her phone rang. The owner was watching the security camera from his laptop and told her to stop being so talkative. When I asked my sister how many cameras were installed in the small space, she identified at least eight and said there could be more. This charming cafe was, in other words, a panopticon with the boss able to tune in anytime from anywhere to see from nearly every angle. Even when all they wanted to do was show a bit of kindness and community to a local eccentric, the workers were just perpetually terrified about losing their job and about being fired. So these security cameras had not been installed to make the workers safe, right? They had been installed to make the workers more insecure, uh, to make them feel that they were always uh, on thin ice. And it's not just baristas, from pickers at Amazon, warehouses, to grocery store clerks, to radiologists, to well-paid software engineers, workers are increasingly surveilled, tracked, ranked, made to feel like the rug could be pulled out from under them at any moment. And this, is, <clears throat> this gets us to, to uh, an element of manufactured insecurity that I think is really key, which is that it reflects a very cynical theory of human motivation. It, it's one that says people will only work under the threat of duress of being fired, for example, the threat of penury, not from an intrinsic desire to create, to collaborate, or to care for one another. So, um, and, and the economist John Kenneth Galbraith actually got to this, what he called the nerve wracking problem of insecurity, he says, is a feature inherent to our competitive economic system, one that takes the form of, quote, episodic unemployment for the worker, on the one hand, and quote, occasional insolvency for the farmer or businessman on the other. This is a quote, along with the carrot of pecuniary reward must go the stick of personal economic disaster. So that's from his um, famous book, The um, Affluent Society. 
Um, the mere fear of job loss causes ill health and losing your job or experiencing unwanted employment, unemployment scholars have shown increases the risk of death. And I think that's, that's the price that, that workers are paying for this insecurity ultimately. I mean, it's low wages, it's job instability and all of the negative things that come from that, but ultimately it increases the risk of death. It's really bad for people's uh, health. Here, the problem is not necessarily poverty in absolute terms, but the insecurity that comes from instability, the threat of downward mobility, the threat of the loss of status, right? And this threat is omnipresent these days for lots of people. Uh, and we see this, um, you know, in the way that people might have in paper the same jobs as their parents or grandparents. You might be an academic, an office clerk, a factory worker, a janitor, a driver, a delivery person, but you're now actually an adjunct or a gig worker or a temp worker or you're employed by a private contractor. So you're doing the same work, but under conditions that are much more precarious, much more insecure. Um, but even if you get you know, the, the white collar job, um, insecurity still hounds you, right? And this is the thing, we live in a society, again, where there's no social safety net, where there's, there is no um, sort of floor to how far you can fall. And all it takes is a devastating enough crisis to reduce the rents fortunate to a state of precarity or poverty. You know, at the Debt Collective, we work a lot on medical debt. So, you know, people do not choose to get sick. They do not uh, choose to um, be hurt. But we live in a world where uh, medical bills and the bankruptcy, um, sorry, where medical bills are the number one cause of bankruptcy, which uh, leads to all sorts of other problems, like, you know, often uh, leads to homelessness. So, you know, all it takes is a family member getting cancer, you know, or some uh, uncertainty, um, maybe business suddenly uh, drops, maybe a job's automated or offshored, maybe the stock in your retirement account goes down again, if you're lucky enough to have one, maybe your home value plummets, maybe um, there's another uh, super storm that floods your, floods your house and, and, and forces you to move. Maybe um, a pandemic hits <laughs> that causes deep insecurity um, and, and unexpected consequences, right? So we are, we are living in a very uh, volatile world. The writer Barbara Ehrenreich in her 1989 study of the psychology of the middle class dubbed the condition that so many people uh, now endure fear of falling. Uh, today though, you know, it's not just the, the middle class. I think more and more people are fear of, uh, afraid of falling and afraid of what lies below. So these stresses don't excuse behavior, I think this is really important to just drive home. They don't excuse the behavior of the boss at that Brooklyn coffee shop who's spying on employees. Um, but I do think it's important uh, to, to kind of understand those larger um, forces that are, are propelling people to act in certain ways uh, and to just recognize how widespread um, uh, the bad feelings that capitalism thrives on actually are. And I think it's important to recognize this because my view is that uh, it will help us uh, create a more just and collective response to the era's intersecting crises. You know, and I and I say this, you know, as an organizer again, because I think one of the challenges that organizers like myself face is the fact that a lot of people who would like to see some kind of progressive social change feel stuck on the insecurity treadmill. They feel too afraid of losing what they have whether they have a little or a lot, to step off and challenge the status quo in a substantive way. So constant insecurity keeps us in line while the conventional methods of achieving security are failing us or crumbl are crumbling beneath our feet. You know, and, and why are they crumbling? Well, for the last 50 odd years, the, you know, there has been a concerted um, attack on the you know, always inadequate, but better than nothing, web of security enhancing policies that were put in place during the 20th century, right? So some talk about this in terms of neoliberalism, uh, just a right-wing backlash, but whatever the case, you know, uh, the right wing and their deep pocketed big mis business allies have worked really hard um, to roll back um, these, these protections. And I think it's important, and it's in that context, I think that it's so important to actually think about what happened in the um, aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, because it wasn't perfect. You know, we don't want to romanticize the sort of New Deal era um, or the, the, um, the expansion of social supports during COVID, but I think it, it's important to, to appreciate just how 
rapidly social supports did expand, um, you know, because of the social policies. So, so after COVID, there was suddenly, and, and I mean it literally, like suddenly overnight, the a, a rapid uh, expansion of the welfare state. And I think that's important because it just shows that it's possible. As a result of this sudden increase in federal income support, millions of people, including my sister who worked at that cafe, were materially secure enough to leave jobs where they had felt disrespected, abused, unhappy, bored, underpaid, unable to advance. And this led to a historic quit rate. So people were kidding their jobs and holding out for something better. Um, so for that brief period, the insecurity induced by the threat of job loss was greatly diminished. And of course, employers were less than thrilled. The Financial Post reported in late 2022 that the actions of the newly, quote, empowered workforce had caused, quote, a growing sense of anxiety among bosses. So, uh, you know, workers having this modicum of, of security thanks to income supports, uh, you know, did not make uh, bosses happy. And um, central banks stepped in uh, to strengthen the boss's hands. They rose, uh, they, they raised interest rates, which weakened the bargaining position of labor, Ostensibly, they did this so they could target inflation, um, and politicians rushed to shut down the pandemic assistance programs. You know, some cited cost, but the real reason, in my view, was that the programs gave workers too much power. The material security they provided was a threat to the insecurity-dependent status quo. Um, and I, you know, I think it's important to note. So, you know, bosses were saying nobody's taking these minimum wage jobs anymore, right? Nobody wants to work. You know, there's they're getting too much help from the government. And those are sort of the same arguments, I mean, essentially the same arguments that the debt collective is hearing in response to student debt cancellation from, from folks on the right. Um, you know, there have been complaints that uh, student debt cancellation would, I mean, literally on Fox News, pundits have said, you know, student debt cancellation will make workers less willing to take bad jobs. Uh, Republican Congress people have complained that student debt cancellation would make poor folks less likely to join the military. <laughs> and so they're very, there can be these moments where they say the quiet part out loud and are very blunt about how useful it is to keep people poor and insecure. Um, here, I think it's also worth quoting uh, Janet Yellen, who uh, was appointed Secretary of the US Treasury in 2021 by Joe Biden. She wrote a 1996 memo, in, which approvingly reported that, quote, job insecurity produces productivity enhancing changes in workers' behavior. Um, companies, she went on to say, could get away with paying non-competitive wages uh, when job insecurity was pervasive without enduring what she called worker backlash, you know, which is a way of saying, you know, without enduring people sort of slacking on the job or quitting <laughs> quietly or loudly or striking. Uh, and this is a quote, presumably increased insecurity makes workers more fearful of unemployment, more desirous of pleasing their employers through improved performance and higher effort and less apt to quit in search of alternative work. So this is, you know, official government policy that that this uh, job insecurity is useful. And this is, again, this job insecurity is not just spontaneous. It's, it's by design, it's manufactured. Um, if we zoom back, uh, 500 years or more, instead of just 50, to take stock of the history of capitalism, we see that this is just a variation on a very old theme. So capitalism, of course, as folks here all know, did not appear fully formed overnight. It evolved very slowly over the course of centuries um, as England's feudal system underwent a profound social and economic transformation that would come to define the modern world. But manufactured, you know, what I would just want to make my point here is just that manufactured insecurity is right there at capitalism's genesis. So for generations, uh, peasantry, the peasantry had exercised customary rights to land held in common, rights to graze their animals, to collect kindling, to glean, to plant, to fish, to access meadows, rivers, and woods, and things like that. Um, during the prolonged and buried process, uh, we called the enclosure movement um, these once communal fields and forests were privatized, so literally enclosed with fences and hedges, displacing commoners from the land that had sustained them and fueling an unprecedented change. So the word here, commoner here, uh, and I'm I'm thinking of the work of the wonderful historian Peter Leinbau, has a double resonance. So people, the people in question were common, they were not aristocrats, but they also engaged in commoning, which is a verb, right? So commoning was a, a mode of survival, a way of living 
Commoners lived off the land they collectively stewarded as a matter of common right. It was commoning, then the act of commoning, of accessing these resources that gave them a baseline of material security. Um, and it was commoning, right? So again, commoning helped them achieve a baseline of material security and independence. And it was the loss of commoning that made them newly insecure in the capitalist sense. Locked out of the pastures and woodlands they had tended to and gathered for generations, people could no longer meet their own subsistence needs and had to turn to the market for survival. Where commoners had once tilled crops and made items for personal subsistence and for their local lord and community, now they had nothing to sell, of course, but their own labor. The resulting social upheaval was particularly devastating for women, and this is something um, Sylvia Federici and others have written about, um, who joined, uh, you know, who also, uh, with their children, went to go work in the new factories and to live in the, the newly forming um, slums. As the Industrial Revolution advanced, so did the intentional and methodical devastation of old ways of life. In 1735, an anonymous pamphleteer called the Commons, quote, a security for those who's sorry, a security for those whom fortune should frown upon, right? So again, uh, the commons were a form of material security. And he noted that enclosure caused uh, a new kind of poverty, a deeper kind of poverty, a kind of poverty that had been previously unknown, a pauperism. And for landowners, this was the point. They understood that the demise of the commons and the desperation and dislocation of the peasantry would yield a more pliable labor force and they had the power to make new laws to this end. So between 1760 and 1870, which was the tail end of the enclosing process, parliament usurped ownership of approximately 7 million acres of common land, one sixth the area of England, um, and uh, did so through thousands of, again, these thousands of acts of par parliament. Uh, while they did so, they also condemned con commoners, the elites condemned commoners as lazy, barbaric, a sordid race. Um, they called them infidels, right? So uh, this huge stigmatization of the poor happening at, at this point. And I, I, you know, I think one of the most potent quotes I found looking at this history was from a landowner named Thomas Rudge, who in 1807 recommended fencing this once common land, privatizing it with hedges that did not bear fruit because he did not want those hedges to be put to life-sustaining use, right? He didn't want poor people to get to eat for free. As he said, the idle among the poor are already too prone to depredation and would still be less inclined to work if every hedge furnished the means of support. So today we take for granted that we have to work a proper job to earn a wage in order to provide for our basic needs, in order to have some modicum of security. And of course we structure our entire lives around this fact. But the history of enclosure reminds us that this arrangement is anything but natural or eternal. Before the wage earner could emerge as our society's paradigmatic subject, a condition that historian Michael Denning calls wagelessness had to be imposed. So wagelessness actually precedes the wage, right? So I think that's actually, it's really important. Capitalism, Denning writes, begins not with the offer of work, but with the imperative to earn a living. In other words, capitalism actually begins with manufactured insecurity, with insecurity in its contemporary sense. And you know, this capitalism is mutable. So in the tw early 20th century, more secure forms of employment would emerge and, and become the norm, at least for a subset of mostly white men, and only, of course, after decades of sustained and often militant labor organizing. Vulnerable and exploited workers forged solidarity from insecurity demanding better wages and treatment from bosses and protection and assistance from, from the government. During the Great Depression, an unlikely assortment of trade unionists, communists, social reformers, some visionary politicians in the mix highlighted insecurity as a central and unjust component of laissez-faire capitalism and mobilized to remedy it. And in uh, another thing I was sort of interested to find uh, or, you know, once I sort of had this lens was to go back to that period of labor organizing uh, during the Great Depression, the New Deal period, and to see actually how central a discussion of insecurity was to those debates. In 1938, and this is just one quote that's indicative of, of how pervasive this frame was, in 1938, President Franklin D. Roosevelt denounced security as, quote, one of the most fearsome evils of our economic system. And he, of course, invoked security as the justification for the New Deal that would form the foundation of the American welfare state. So just, just a lot of attention 
to um, to insecurity as something people were uh, experiencing. And this was um, something that began with left-wing groups. Uh, and this was in the US and Canada. And then that language was eventually adopted by FDR. So such an outcome was far from inevitable. Insecurity is an unruly state of being, and it can be channeled in different ways. Insecurity can serve as a conduit to empathy, humility, and solidarity, or it can spur defensive and destructive compulsions. History, including recent history, shows that hard times or even the mere anticipation of them, the feeling of being economically insecure, of anticipating the worst, whether or not those feelings are objectively justified, can increase the appeal of racism and xenophobia. It was hardly uh, for day, uh, preordained, right? that we would look back on the 30s and 40s in the United States as a period of progressive economic and social progress. People had to organize and fight to make it so. They had to alchemize the insecurity people uh, were experiencing by organizing, they had to turn that into solidarity. Across the world today, not unlike a century ago, the far right is busy gaining ground by speaking directly to atomized, anxious, afraid, isolated people uh, by, by Flame, inflaming those fears and offering scapegoats. So today the scapegoats include immigrants, Muslims, Jews, black people, trans people, women seeking abortions, students uh, protesting for Palestinian labor, liberation on campus, right? You know, name, name the, the scapegoat of the day. Too often insecurity fuels the embrace of social hierarchy and domination. What more tempting solution to a discomforting sense of insecurity than donning a mask of superiority and invincibility? Thus, we have people who denounce snowflakes, who need safe spaces while taking shelter behind bigotry, puffing themselves up by marking, sorry, by mocking fragility and denying their own vulnerability. In these cases, it's not enough to point out that such individuals are often more privileged or better off than others. In other words, we can't just emphasize inequality and sort of where they fit in the social hierarchy. Insecurity is about feelings as much as facts. Instead, we need to figure out ways to channel insecurity in constructive directions, indignation at the way our current system manufactures and exploits our fears and anxieties can help strengthen existing movements and coalesce new ones, uniting powerful, expanding, and I hope surprising coalitions that can fight for collective forms of security based in care and concern rather than desperation and distress. And I love etymology. My work is full of references to words and where they come from. And I just want to note that Actually, the Latin root of the word security is actually cura, which means care. So I'm talking about um, uh, ultimately, you know, we need to rethink what we mean by by security, uh, which I'll try to get to if I have time. You know, my own experience as a co-founder of the Debt Collective uh, really has shown me this: that economic insecurity can help galvanize people to organize for redistributive policies and an expanded welfare state. You know, and so some of our work is just as basic as holding space for people to talk about their struggles and their suffering and their fears and to feel uh, what, and to kind of get, uh, at least get some relief from the stigma and shame that being poor and indebted brings in this, in this society. Um, and we, and through that honesty, you know, camaraderie and solidarity is built. Insecurity can become a gateway, uh, expanding the way, ex expanding the way people um, understand themselves and see themselves as connected to others. So recognizing our shared existential and economic insecurity and understanding how our insecurity is weaponized against us can be a first step towards forging solidarity. And solidarity, I think, is perhaps the most important form of, of security we possess, the security of confronting our shared predicament as humans on this planet in crisis together. So again, as I just hinted at, the kind of security I want to create is very different from the kind we are typically told to pursue. And you know, I think it's just important to acknowledge this. I spent my formative intellectual years under the shadow of the war on terror, um, where uh, there was um, uh, uh, you know, a march towards uh, war uh, in the name of democracy and also in the name of security. Um, one of the first projects I ever worked on was a film about Arab and Muslim detainees um, in the wake of 9-11. Uh, and I interviewed many people who had been illegally detained uh, and that experience taught me that we always need to ask security of what, security for whom, security at what cost. Uh, and when I was doing that, you know, I was like 21, I didn't realize that this 
trade off, the supposedly trade off, the supposed trade off between liberty and security was a centuries old motif, one um, brought to us most famously, of course, by the philosopher Thomas Hobbes, uh, back with his 1651 book Leviathan. Um, but um, uh, it's, uh, I think it's, you know, just worth pausing on it and reflecting on this supposed trade-off uh, and, 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 and challenging it. Um, you know, Hobbes' point was that what we need to do is sort of submit our freedom to the state <laughs> and that that's the way to achieve security and safety. Um, and I, I just want to say that, you know, fortunately, modern states, unlike the Leviathan that Hobbes envisioned, modern states are supposed to provide a security as a matter of democratic right. We're not, we, you know, on, in theory at least, do not have to sacrifice our civil liberties. To do so, we're ent entitled security, and we're actually entitled to security. This is something we rarely talk about, but we're actually entitled to security um, uh, in various forms in international, uh, international law, um, in the United uh, um in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example, you know, it's very um, unambiguous and, and a right to security is mentioned many times. And I just think this is interesting. I'm struck as an organizer by how rarely we actually on the left talk about security. In other words, you know, because we, um, we tend to talk about democracy, we tend to talk about equality, we've talked about freedom, even solidarity. And what we've done is kind of seed security uh, as, a, as, a, as an ideal, something to reach for to the right. Um, and I think that that's a mistake. I think that you know, not only is it important to address people's insecurities um, and their, their emotional, affective, feeling lives so that we can organize with them, build community. I also think we need to talk about, well, what, what is it that we're trying to reach? What would a more secure society um, look like, and we need to reclaim some of that language uh, from the right wing because there is definitely uh, something there they are discussing. Um, security is not something that we can achieve heroically or stoically on our own, whether through consumption or recycling, education, ambition, mindfulness, <laughs> you know, getting rich. We cannot breathe our way out of thorny social problems. We cannot amass enough wealth to wholly buffer ourselves from them. Instead, uh, we need to organize uh, and save, save, e save each other. So I think the best kind of security, again, is the security we find in solidarity. Uh, but I think that language is too important um, to, to see to the right wing today. So that's it. Thank you. And I'm really interested in uh, this idea of the debt collective. Uh, what is it? How does it function? What does it do? That sort of thing. Awesome. Thanks, Jeffrey. Astra. Yeah. Um, so the Debt Collective is a, uh, a group that is most known for working on student debt. Uh, that's sort of where we've sort of made our biggest political mark in figuring out some of the mechanisms for which the federal government can actually cancel um, federal student loans, which are the bulk of the student loans in this country. But we are we're actually, um, our focus is much bigger than that. So, you know, our, our aim is not just the cancellation of debts, but we really want to build a political power so that we can restructure our economy and our society. Because ultimately, um, you know, the problem is that we have a system uh, that forces individuals to debt finance what we think should be public goods. So if you have universal health care, you don't have medical debt, right? If healthcare is provided as an actual uh, public good and a human right, then you don't have um, medical debt. If education was properly funded and also seen as something um, that was a true public good, you know, then people wouldn't have to be uh, uh, mortgaging their futures to, to get an education. Um, the same thing goes for housing. <laughs> we have a, uh, a system of, of housing that basically um, leads people you know, the American dream of owning a home really is the American dream of being in debt and having a mortgage instead of uh, setting our sights a bit higher and thinking, well, what about social housing, right? What if what if housing was decommodified and um, available on very different terms on non-market terms? So we take inspiration from the labor movement, but we also take inspiration from um, other forms of, uh, of organizing. We do a lot of collaborating with tenants unions, um, but essentially we try to bring people into formation around their self-interest, right? You know, people have an interest in getting their debts canceled, but I think also a larger interest in 
you know, uh, winning what we call reparative public goods um, that would uh, enrich us all in in um, a, very, a more expansive sense, right? Like leave us not just financially better off, but socially better off. So we do everything from organizing um, uh in you know, sort of conventional political pressure campaigns to uh, working on narrative and media. So really pushing back this idea that um, debtors, that debt is the fault of the debtor. So one of our slogans, you know, is that people do not live beyond their means. We're denied the means to live. Um, we, for example, we don't use the language of debt forgiveness because we don't think that someone who has medical bills did something wrong. You know, they didn't do something wrong by getting sick. Um, you don't, you didn't do anything wrong by going to grad school and choosing a field that you love. So we talk about debt cancellation, debt ab abolition, debt um, relief, but not debt forgiveness. We uh, have sort of a policy side. So we um, have been instrumental in figuring out the mechanisms through which, again, the federal government can cancel student debt. Uh, uh, and um, we also engage in more militant tactics like debt strikes. So campaigns of debt refusal. So any kind of, any lever of power we can organize and grasp, we do. Um, but the idea, you know, I think it's important to say, and because of the way labor law is structured in this country, there are lots of folks who work who just do not have a chance to join a labor union. And so we see debtors unions as potentially very complementary. Um, you know, any, your, your debt follows you around, whether you're, what, you know, if you change jobs or if you're unemployed, go back to school. And so let's use that to our advantage by coming into a, um, uh, a, a new kind of collectivity together um, so that we can, you know, I uh, open this, you know, we think this is a sort of un, un I wouldn't say untried because we're trying it, but just that there is a lot of potential that this is a new avenue in the fight against inequality uh, in, uh, in all its forms. And as I hinted at in the animation, it has a long history, actually. There's a long history of um, debtor organizing in this country that we just don't hear that much about. Hi, Astra. Um, hey. Thank you for your talk today. Really appreciated listening to it. Um, I have two questions. One you already touched on, which is um, what are some of the inspirations and um, people and works that have influenced um, your perspective and all the perspectives of Debt Collective. And the other question is, um, how can people get involved and start organizing with Debt Collective? Yeah, that second one is my favorite question. So thank you for asking it. Um, you know, I think I would be remiss to not give a shout out to David Graeber, the um, anarchist anthropologist who I'm sure people have read his work. So David was an old friend of mine, actually is the person who invited me to occupy Wall Street. Um, and uh, he was instrumental in, um, I, I have sometimes described him as he's kind of put the band together. Like he brought a lot of us into community. Uh, uh, many of us who would are still working on the deck collective as a project day to day. And then he went off, he left us um, to organize um, and, and, to, and he left us to organize and to figure things out ourselves, right? To really figure out how to engage with the state. And, you know, I think, the, Folks of the debt collective, we you know kind of ide we identify as a socialist organization that's not just for socialists. Anyone who needs what we're offering is welcome to join. Uh, you know, if, if we will try to get you debt relief. You can participate in our political education. Um, gosh, who is? I feel like the question of like who has inspired us is almost like too big. I just feel like I'm inspired by so many different traditions of organizing, so many different movements. Um, uh, so I'm kind of, I'm almost pulling a blank. I feel like my books are just like full of my heroes. That's one of the great things about writing is you get to lift them up. Um, but yeah, Debt Collective, you know, please join on our website and come to a new member call. That's the first step. So we have new member calls really regularly. We have right now, um, a campaign, uh, to keep pressuring Joe Biden. I mean, what I said in that animation is still true. Um, despite the shenanigans by the Supreme court, Joe Biden still has the power to, to cancel student debt. We really think it's all the more urgent. He, he does. So, um, so I'd invite you to come to a, a new member call and then to, um, you know, see if anything is happening in your area. And if there isn't anything to take the lead and become a member leader and start a chapter. So yeah, definitely go to the website, sign up. Hey, first of all, thanks for a really fantastic talk. I thought that was uh, brilliant. So 
this is quite a random and specific question, but um, I'm interested in the way you think about the relationship between insecurity and a related concept, precarity. The way you're talking about it, do you think that they're synonymous or is precarity in, for example, how it's been discussed in relation to writing on the precariat, is that a specific form of insecurity? I mean, so I think the power of insecurity in the way you've developed the concept is the breadth and inclusivity of the different experiences that it speaks to. But could that also in its own way be a potential weakness in that because it speaks to so much heterogeneity of experience, it actually sort of becomes a little abstract, meaning it could potentially be harder to build a collective identity around it, which is why I'm mm. guessing, of course, you have a specific focus on debt uh, and, and so on. I suppose basically my question is, how are you thinking about this in relation to thinking about collective actor formation in terms of mm -hmm. identity? Because a lot of the most successful social movements we've seen recently build around a concept of identity that can often be quite specific and therefore uh, uh, inculcates a, a sense of sort of power and anger and so on. Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And, and in a way, um, I mean, I think a lot of the way you framed it kind of has has some of the answers within. I mean, I would say precarity, precariat, precarity is a subset of insecurity. So I am, I'm going capacious, right? I mean, I like the capaciousness of the concept of insecurity that it is, again, an affect, an emotion. And it's also a term used by, um, by sociologists, right? To, you know, people talk of housing insecurity, job insecurity, um, food insecurity. I mean, it's a real socioeconomic phenomena that people research and actually have metrics to define and so on and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, the precariat, you know, precarious work. I mean, you can, you can, you can use on some level, I guess these terms, you know, insecure work, precarious work, uh, a, a bit interchangeably, but certainly the way I'm talking about it is more, um, uh, more capacious. And I also think the word insecurity and insecurity, and this is some of what's in the book, those are actually terms that are really essential, really central to liberal political philosophy. So when you go back and you read your Hobbes and your um, you know, key liberal thinkers, Bentham, who I mentioned, of course, and many others, those are actually words they're using, right? And 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 uh, and really talk, and they're also talking about security in a very specific way. And so I think that's also something that is interesting to me too, right? The centrality of security to a certain conception of liberal democracy um, uh, and uh, the problems with it, because it's a kind of security that is essentially security of person and possession, so physical security. So that has implications for just the centrality of sort of a kind of policing to the liberal democratic tradition. So anyway, so I think I'm adding more capaciousness and, and more um, threads to go down there. But I think that that's, uh, that's part of it. In terms of identity formation, I mean, I think you're right, right? Like most um, movements, you know, not only are they about posing an identity, but often taking a kind of um, a stigmatized identity and and uh, saying, no, we know we shouldn't be stigmatized. Actually, we're powerful, <laughs> you know, and we are um, we're oppressed and we have we should have a voice. And certainly the debt collective is trying to do that by you know, nobody really wanted to identify as a debtor. <laughs> it's like and it's still a challenge to get people to do that. But saying, oh, actually, you know, if you there's millions and millions of debtors, 100 million people in the United States have medical debt. Like, wow, that's a huge um, number of people who could potentially come into an alliance. Um, so I, I think that's the right move in terms of building a union, building a political organization. That said, you know, I also am a writer. I'm thinking um, outside the, the confines of the debt collective. And I, what was on my mind as I was working on the, on this book in particular was, you know, we need allies that don't identify as debtors. <laughs> like it's not enough to just mobilize, maybe if we can mobilize the 100 million and get them really organized, then we'd, we'd be golden. But you know, where we were in our political fight with the Biden administration and beyond, I just felt like, you know, how is, how can, can I, I, I wanted to start thinking about frames that might actually build some threads of connection or a kind of framework for understanding between these identity groups. Um, and, you know, so this, this book sort of weaves together, um, uh, 
some stories from the debt collective, but also folks, again, folks who have more than zero dollars, who have means, who are still insecure, precarious, however you want to say it. So to me, those these tasks, I guess I'm saying these tasks aren't mutually exclusive to me, like build the organized identi- you know, identity um, uh, based formation, <laughs> but also try to figure out what are the frames in which we can build alliances, you know, build solidarity beyond that even to say, hey, you know, yeah, you may not be a debtor yourself, but the economy is still not working for you. And maybe this is a conceptual framework that can help you um, see some potential alignment. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Astra, there's a question in the chat and, and a comment um, specifically um, related to electoral politics, which you didn't mention um, a lot in your talk. Uh, Bill Delaney writes, if our most efficient and easy path to dissent is to is to vote, what can we do to mo- now to motivate more people to vote? And then he asks about, you know, this upcoming election. So where does electoral politics fit within um, your vision uh, that you you outlined, and how do you guys use it as a tactic, if yeah. at all? Yeah, I mean, the Debt Collective is not an electoral group. Um, I, I would say that it's interesting to me that when you look at Joe Biden's messaging and his memes, you know, he's leaning in very strongly to the debt cancellation that he's done. No, He knows, I think the Biden administration was very skeptical. They didn't think it would be as popular as it was uh, and then they saw this tremendous public response from the inadequate plan that they announced and then their complete criminal mishandling of debt cancellation. So that's a whole other talk, all other topic. But nevertheless, the crumbs that they managed to push past the finish line, you know, they're just they're boasting about them because uh, it's popular. And I think that's one of the electoral messages is, you know, concrete, clear things that help working people, you know, are are. Um, are are a way to galvanize uh, an otherwise kind of demoralized um, base, and um, and so I you know I think we're intervening in the uh, electoral process by trying to do that right by trying to push the party that is currently in power to actually deliver on some of their first we push them to make a decent promise and then to actually deliver on it um, and to earn people's votes because I do think that votes. Um, uh, have to be earned. I mean, there's a lot of energy and money right now going into get out, get the vote operations. And I think a lot of that money is being lit on fire because it's being used to just mobilize people one time to go to the polls instead of building lasting political infrastructure and lasting political institutions that can hold people between elections. So, um, you know, I think this is an incredibly critical election. I do not want Donald Trump to be the president. <laughs> My cards are on the table, but voting in this, you know, to me, I'm like voting should take like, you know, it shouldn't take two minutes in a in a country, you know, I'm sitting in the South where there's a lot of voter suppression, often takes hours and hours to get to the voting booth. But, you know, ultimately I we need also to build these um, in this institutions, this, this movement infrastructure uh, that can um, organize people uh, between these periodic elections. And also then I think help hold the politicians who are in power more accountable um, so that people are less, again, demoralized and disgusted with what they see emanating, especially from Washington, D.C. So um, you can always read my book, Democracy May Not Exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone. I also made a documentary called What is Democracy? where I explore these ideas in more detail. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful, thanks. I guess, uh, Astra, I have a question or I'll try and formulate it as one. So in your talk, I, I think you did a really beautiful job about describing the compulsion um, that that is obviously at the root of capitalism, right? That we must actually um, uh, work in order to eat or to live. Um, and 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 at the same time, and, and that you frame compulsion uh, or, or um, insecurity as fear, um, and, but it's a, of an unknown of, of some sort of future ilk. Um, but it, it seems to me as though that, that some pollution of, of losing a job in some way or, or that fear of something, it can also be very immediate too. And I'm, 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 I'm commenting on this because when I think about my work um, as, a, as a former labor organizer, thinking about um, 
uh, getting folks to see themselves as workers, but then to take the next step, which is to engage, to mobilize, to become involved, is something that it, it's not it's not enough for there to be some sort of future fear. I feel as though there there hasn't, in my experience anyway, been some very immediate sense of I don't want to use the word, but danger or precarity, insecurity, um, yeah. fear. And so in your experience, how how do you guys cultivate a lasting sense of um, of solidarity in order to make those things happen? Because it's not enough, you know, as you said, um, there are many of us, including myself, that have student loan debt. Um, and we and 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 I wasn't on the front line of demanding that that Joe Biden um, uh, cancel uh, student loan debt. And, and there are many, many like me. So. How do you move us? How do you move people to to become more involved? I think that is a, a major question mm -hmm. of the day. Yeah, I mean, a lot of organizers are trying to fix, fit, figure exactly this out. I mean, some some things. So I totally agree, right? Like people are often moved by urgency. I mean, you know, some a lot of our members are in a state of emergency. I mean, um, we've had recent member calls, calls where people are actually on the line with. On, on Zooms with members of Congress where folks have been homeless, where people have been calling in from their cancer treatment beds, you know, so urgency is there. I'm just, you know, with the emphasis on insecurity, I'm just saying it's also forward looking, like you might be okay today, but a huge, you know, there's the, the fact is we don't just live in the present, we're future oriented creatures. So I, I, I don't think they're exclusive, right? I mean, people come with, um, and there can be times when your personal emergency is so overwhelming, you don't have freaking time to organize, you know, right? Like there, this, it, which gets me to kind of part of the answer to your question. You know, I think one core like principle needs to be like, don't waste people's time. <laughs> you know, people's time is precious. People have families, people often have multiple jobs. They're trying to go to school sometimes. And so, um, you know, I think it's incumbent on us as organizers to try to think of things that are worth people's precious energy and precious resources, you know, um, that that we'd actually show up for, right? So just trying to give people busy work or like fill, fill the hour or something. So I think that's a really important people for keeping, I'm sorry, I think that's an important, you know, guideline for keeping people um, engaged. Um, I I think the future actually comes into this too, in the sense that you know, I motivating, I think it's absolutely essential and, and there's nothing wrong. I think it's good to tap into people's self-interest, right? You might get your debts canceled. You don't have to even subscribe to our political ideology, but you might get that, you might get some financial relief or something like that. Um, you might get a raise at your job, <laughs> whatever it is. You might, your, you know, your landlord might finally fix the boiler. Um, self-interest is great, but I do think that, the the bigger thing, the bigger cause, the bigger ideal, like the the uh, is is actually a core component of keeping people mobilized um, and engaged. And um, you know, I see this, for example, in debt collecting members who um, we won a big fight over a for profit college called Corinthian Colleges. So we started fighting during the Obama administration. So when debt cancellation was on nobody's radar, um, and in 2022. The Biden administration basically finally did exactly what we had been demanding all along, canceled billions of dollars in debt for over a half a million students who had been defrauded from this by this predatory school. A lot of the folks who were key to that fight, going back to 2014, 15, 16, are still involved with the debt collective because they now want to see college be free. <laughs> they want to see working class people like themselves get to just go to school to learn, to not even go to get just, you know, vocational training. So they might be able to make 20 bucks an hour at the job instead of, you know, 10. Um, and so I do think that uh, I, you can't build a movement just based on a utopian vision, but when you have that right mix of sort of self-interest, next steps, and like, hey, we're fighting for a better world. I think that that's uh, the key. And we're not going to get everybody. So it's fine. You were doing other things like there's all sorts of other causes, you know, like I wish I was on the front line of the climate fight. I can't, I'm too busy doing what I'm doing now. That's fine. We, 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 um, but I think we should all be doing something. Well, there's one other question. Pete came in again. Do you have any film projects planned that will take on these issues, Astra? 
Maybe. I don't know. There are some filmmakers following me around um, giving the lectures. So I don't know, maybe there will be a, a, a film. They might um, translate some of the ideas of the book into a film, but it's out of my hands. It's easier to write. You just need a keyboard. <laughs> the films, are, films are tough. You need a budget and a crew and, um, uh, and I have my hands full these days. So I think, uh, I think if I make a film down the road, it will be much more weirder. That is, it will be, yeah. Um, we'll stay tuned. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> oh, okay, we have one more question and it's from It's Me. So It's Me, please feel free to uh, ask your question. Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, my name is Jeremiah. I, I'm just not very good at this tech, tech stuff. Um, thank you, Astra. I just want to, you know, I really appreciate the conversation that you had with the, um, on Wart last Monday and um, very informative. And that's how I learned about this, this talk. Uh, I was able to take the day off from work. Um, I'm a, I'm a teamster. So I'm so fortunate. I, I feel like I have a working class kind of background. Uh, that's why my heart's beating. It's hard to kind of formulate my question. Um, but there has to be some unlearning, uh, this kind of indoctrination, whether it be this capitalist, in, you know, individualism. So many of us are like watching TV all day long um, or all night. <laughs> but um, there's like the me and the you. Uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti talked about security, the security of nation, the security of me, that that is, in essence, planting the seeds for insecurity throughout the world. Um, how, how, you know, what do we do? How do we get rid of, of the divide, essentially the me, and the you, you know, how, how, like, what do we do to get rid of that? And um, how do we communicate to so many people out there? There's so many people who aren't paying attention. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, how do you do it? So where do you, Astra, yeah. big questions for you as we end. How do we, where would you suggest Jeremiah start? Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for coming and for, for um, listening the other day and to, to being here. And I mean, it's a big question, but I, I think I, a huge question. And I, I, you know, I, I think we always have to start where we are. So sometimes it's like what opportunities are available to us, what possibilities there are, what political levers we might be able to reach, what communities we might be able to touch are so contingent on, on where we are you know, you have a job where you are in the Teamsters. So that's a place that you, you know, have uh, an amazing opportunity uh, to be involved in. Um, in other places, the most urgent fight might be a fight, fight against fracking, or maybe there's a really exciting person who's running to be on the school board or something, right? And so my advice is always like, okay, just, we need to take a breath and look around us where where we are, what community we can, in, can join. And I, sometimes I think it's that simple too. It's like join something. <laughs> it could be the debt collective. It could be a union. Um, uh, because ultimately breaking down the me and you, as you're saying, you know, another way of saying that is like, you know, we need the collective. We need collective uh, forms of, of power. Um, and, you know, the more um, uh, full of, and the more vibrant and the more, um, uh, inspiring groups are, I think the more likely people are going to be to turn off that TV and get off the couch and come out and give some of their precious time. Um, so, you know, I think we have to just start really, really humbly, um, and, uh, uh, and just start working with other people, you know, to do whatever it is that we can do where we're located, um, instead of kind of trying to figure out what the one big solution is. Um, you know, because just like, Adrian was saying, you know, I wasn't able to work on student debt. You know, there's all sorts of things I'm not able to work on that I care about. And I kind of have to trust that other people are going to hold some of those um, important uh, causes. <laughs> and that, you know, we're, we're all just doing our, the part that we can, um, and hopefully it'll add, add up. Um, last, I guess the last thing too, I'll say is that 
it's so important to invite people in. I think we forget just like the basic power of being nice. And I'll never forget David Graeber. I mentioned him at the first day of Occupy Wall Street. He was like a radical maitre d'. You know, he's like, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the liberated Zuccotti Park. And just making folks feel that their presence mattered. Um, and I think that's, um, I, I, you know, it's a really simple piece of advice, but it's really important. If we want to organize other folks, you know, open the door and then do more than that. Go out <laughs> and try to pull people in. I think it really, um, you know, we need we need to make our movie our movements as inviting and welcoming to other folks um, who might just be a little intimidated, might just be a little afraid to come out of their shells. Perfect. That's a perfect place to end. Thank you so much to Astra Taylor and to all of you that have attended. Um, happy Mardi Gras to all of those who celebrate King Cake. Uh, please be well, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great day.